Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is my top 10 ways to prevent insect and disease problems in your landscape, vegetable garden, whatever, whatever type of gardening uh, that, you're, that you're doing. Uh, these 10 things will not prevent all insect and disease problems uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but they will help greatly reduce, I hope, uh, the problems that you see in your yard. I get a tremendous amount of questions about what to spray for this and what to spray for that. And um, I had a nursery uh, for many years and I have done a lot of spraying in my life. I, I know a lot about the chemistry uh, that we use, organic and non-organic, uh, you know, chemistry that we use to control insect and disease problems. Uh, I've chosen to spray none of those in my yard in the last 20 years. There's not been a fungicide or an insecticide sprayed in this yard uh, in, 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 like I say, two, at least two decades. And so, uh, and I have very few problems in this yard. Uh, you know, I, I follow a kind of a set of, uh, a group of ideas that I have, you know, that I've, you know, kind of observed over the years uh, that, that are helpful uh, in, in, in reducing the number of insect, insect problems and disease problems uh, in the landscape. Like I say, again, it won't prevent them all. And at the, and at the time you get something, you know, you can decide whether or not it's for you to uh, spray or not, or remove that plant. Uh, and in some cases, I'll just remove something if it's repeatedly, uh, you know, causing me problems that I'm, I, I feel like I might end up spraying for. So let's get started. This is probably going to be long, subtle in, because <laughs> it's, it's uh, like I say, it is uh, 10 things and, and they need some uh, description and, and reason uh, for, for why they're in the list. So the first one is pretty obvious and it, it's picking plants. Uh, you, you know, if you, if you pick roses as something that you want in your landscape, you know, roses come with a big set of disease problems and insect problems. They just do. And, uh, you, you know, even even new new varieties of roses that are more disease resistant, they're not insect resistant, and so they're still going to get uh, those chewing insects that come along, and they get pretty much everything. You know, mites, aphids, uh, uh, be, every beetle in the world wants to chew on them. And then, of course, you know, if you're using old-fashioned roses, they come with all the disease issues as well. So I don't have any roses in this yard. I love roses. There's there's a rose garden in Raleigh um, at the Raleigh Little Theater. If you ever get a chance to see it. It's beautiful, it's fantastic. It gets sprayed a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, because you put that many roses together, they're gonna get sprayed a lot. There's a, there's a plant called, uh, uh, there's a group of plants called Euonymus, and the golden Euonymus, which is, is purchased quite a bit, and there's one called Silver King Euonymus. Beautiful gold foliage and variegated shrubs. Uh, they're sold pretty much any box store you go to where, where, where you can grow this plant sells them. It comes with its own insect called Euonymus scale if you you're going to get this insect and so that's another plant that i wouldn't put in my yard so doing a little bit of research as to how how vulnerable the plants that you're picking um, are to insect and disease problems would probably be uh would probably be beneficial not a lot of those things being sold but there are some you know and, and i and I, I i walk past some plants and i go well that would never go in my yard for that uh very reason okay so that one's pretty obvious you know pick plants that aren't you know, aren't, aren't all that you, you likely to get insect and disease problems. Number two is where we're going to place those plants. And this is probably, probably the most important thing on this entire list, really. Uh, if you put plants, if you put a full sun plant in the shade, it is going to stress that plant and that stress, that plant is going to be more likely to get insect problems. Let me show you something real quick on a crepe myrtle I have over here. So surprisingly, this is actually a dwarf crepe myrtle. You're looking up at it right now. It's about eight feet tall, but it's been here uh, over 20 years. It's a purple variety. It's just starting to uh, open up up here right now. And generally, uh, for the last uh, two decades, this time of year, it's actually had aphids uh, on the end of it because I put it up against my house uh, right here and the trees, spin you around slow, uh, over there, we're blocking the sun in the late afternoon, and it uh, had no air movement on it, and it was in too much shade, and the aphids were just causing all kinds of problems, and the aphids secrete, their secretion, there's a fungus that forms on it called sooty mold. It's terrible. I removed, I pushed this line of trees back uh, last year, or the year before, and uh, created a little bit more sun over here, and now this plant is completely clean, and so, you know, it's really, you know, it was the placement that was actually causing uh, the insect problem. Uh, and and I, like I say, I was, I was ready to take it out. It's actually got a couple Japanese beetles on it right this second, because we're at the time when the Japanese beetles are uh, out and working hard. But I have another item on my list that's coming up 
that's very important for your Japanese beetles. So one other thought on plant placement is the spacing that you're putting in between your, in, in between your plants. Uh, if, if plants are super, super crowded, uh, it gives a place for insect problem, you know, insects to hide, gives a place for uh, disease to form because the leaves stay wetter longer when there's no air movement around your plants. And so, you know, when you have the morning dew on your plants, they end up staying wet until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Whereas if there's a little space between them, as soon as the sun's on them in the morning, they, they dry out pretty quickly. That helps reduce disease issues. All these things are gonna grow and, and fill in this space, but I'm not initially, uh, you know, slamming them, you know, two feet apart when they're going in the ground. So continuing with plant placement, uh, that crepe myrtle is a sun and shade issue. Uh, you can also have wet and dry issues. If you take a plant that likes to stay a little dry in the landscape and you put it in a place where, the, where it doesn't drain in the low spot in your yard, uh, that, that additional stress from having wet feet is going to invite uh, insect and disease problems. That's the way uh, this works. These, these insects aren't um, all on the planet just to frustrate you. Um, a lot of them are actually on the planet to eliminate weakened plant material. It's not, good for the, it's not good for the other plants to have a very weak plant in the group. And so these insects and disease problems are coming along and they're trying to eliminate that plant. That's what they're telling you, okay, is that there's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with it and it needs to be removed for the health of the rest of the group. And so, again, that plant placement thing, uh, make, make, sure, make, make sure you're following whatever you know, the tag says. Some things just need to be elevated. Uh, in your yard in order for you to grow it uh, in your space. Okay, let's move on to number three. And another, another way you can really stress plants is with fertilizer. Uh, I use uh, organic fertilizer in this yard once in the late winter, early spring. And things that I put in during the spring, I'll continue to uh, put fertilizer on them. I'm usually done by about now with any fertilizer that I would use. And uh, uh, too much nitrogen fertilizer. Too much nitrogen, it's the first number in your fertilizer. If you're dumping too much nitrogen uh, in, your, in your yard, on your shrubs and your trees and your vegetables, that nitrogen produ uh, um, puts on lots of new tender growth. And that new tender growth is an invitation uh, for chewing insects uh, to, uh, to come along and uh, mess with your plants. I'd rather have slow and steady growth on things than try to push them really, really quickly. I find that the more I push them, the more insect and disease problems. When I had the nursery, there were several reasons why we had to spray there. Um, and one of which was we were pushing the plants so hard that they just constantly had this fresh, new, uh, tender new growth on them that was an absolute invitation to any insect and disease problem. So put, I usually use about three quarters of the recommended rate uh, from the fertilizer uh, once in the late winter. And I use an organic fertilizer because I don't want to push the plant directly. I want to feed the soil and then let the soil feed my plant. And then the plant just takes what it needs from the soil. If I, if I, if I use a high nitrogen um, urea based fertilizer and go directly to feed the plant, I find that I end up with more insect and disease problems uh, that way. Okay, the next thing is not having a monoculture. A monoculture is having too many of the same type of plant. Another issue that I had in the nursery business and every nurseryman has is we plant a block of a thousand things together, the exact same plant. And it's an absolute invitation for insect and disease problems to really run amok uh, very quickly. If one plant gets stressed and then, you know, it sends out that little signal, you know, the little bat signal for the, uh, for the insects or the mites, mites, especially in a nursery situation, to come in. And then the next thing you know, it's spreading very quickly through a large group of plants. I have, uh, I, I don't know, in the hundreds of varieties of plants in this yard now, and I don't have more than five of something. Um, well, no, I've got, I do have this row of boxwoods around this uh, garden right here, uh, but the red, any, other than that, I don't probably don't have a group of maybe more than five or six uh, plants of, of any type in this yard. So I've really varied the, the variety and the number of things uh, that I have uh, in this yard. Because again, and especially in a screen, and I did a, I did a, a video year before last, it's a pretty popular video actually, on why to use a mix of plants in your screen. Uh, you know, I've got a, a border that runs 120 feet behind this camera right here. It's got five or six different varieties of screening plants in it. Uh, and, and one is if I ever do get an insect or disease problem, it's not gonna take out my entire screen. 
Uh, if I get some sort of weather event, it's not going to take out my entire screen. Cold won't take out, you know, so on and so forth. But one of the other reasons is to break it up for, you know, if I, if I do get any of those problems, it's not easy for them to just jump from one plant to the next, to the next, to the next. There you go. So like I say, despite the number of plants that I have in this yard and the number of varieties and number of, you know, just the general number of opportunities that insect and disease problems would have to find my stuff, I don't have a lot of them of those issues. None of these plants that you're seeing right now do. But if I come down to here, this Veronica, and I've left these weeds around this Veronica on purpose for the last couple of weeks, uh, these weeds right here are giving a hiding place to some sort of chewing insect which is absolutely tearing up this Veronica right here. I don't know if you can see, you know, all the holes that are in the leaves uh, on this Veronica. And it is a direct result of these weeds right in here that I have not pulled. And so I have predators out here that are capable of cleaning up whatever this issue is out here, because I've never sprayed them. So, you know, I've got plenty of things to eat that insect, whatever it is, it looks like a flea beetle maybe is what's going on there. Um, I have things out here that could take care of it, but those weeds are giving cover to that insect and uh, not allowing my predators to find them. And so that's an issue, weeds. Uh, keep, keeping, keeping your beds weed free is definitely a, a, a way to uh, eliminate, uh, not eliminate, but to help, help prevent a lot of insect and disease problems and just getting rid of a hiding place for them. So number six is uh, very important, I, I think. It is, inviting birds into your yard. You know, by not spraying, you know, chemicals out here for the last 20 years, I've built up other types of predators, um, you know, smaller insects that can take out a lot of these uh, insect problems uh, that I have, some parasitic wasp and ladybugs and all those kinds of things exist in my yard because I haven't sprayed, you know, anything at all. And those things are helpful. But when you have high pressure situations, like when Japanese beetles come out, Birds are your friend. I have a pair of brown thrashers. They're probably mad at me right now because I'm standing in their space. They stay out here all day long and pick Japanese beetles and other things off of my plants over here. Uh, the, it's a bird, it's a slightly bigger than a robin. It's in the, I think they're in a the mockingbird uh, family. They, they're similar to mockingbirds. Uh, little dinosaur looking, little dinosaur looking brown birds. Uh, I welcome them to my yard. Uh, I've got this screen that I have back here is a great place for them to nest. I've got a bird feeder in the front yard, although the thrashers don't use the bird feeder, but the robins do and some other birds do that, uh, that uh, are also you know, predators as well, eating, eating beetles and, and other insects uh, for me in the yard. But uh, those brown thrashers are just fantastic. I had beetles, this is a fig plant right here. I looked at it one day, uh, maybe two weeks ago, and saw the beetles were on it, you know, maybe 10 or 15 beetles. I don't see the first bit of damage that ever that happened to that fig whatsoever. Uh, they came, those, those birds came in here and took them out in a hurry. And so having birds in your yard is very important. And it's not just like I said, it's not just about having a bird feeder. It's also about having plants in your yard that give the birds cover, that give them protection. I've got a screen behind me there. There's kind of a border between me and the road right there. I've got that border over there. So I've got some protected space in here. They feel comfortable, but they're in enough open space that they can see anything that may attack them. And they come in here and do a lot of work for me uh, every day. So that was number six. Number seven is mulch. And let me show you a couple things based on mulch. So here's our big leaf hydrangea. They're very susceptible to leaf spot issues. And I hope you can see this right here. This is, a, I'll pull that leaf off actually. But you see these little brown spots on that leaf. Uh, that is a leaf spot issue. It's usually probably related to how, you know, how long the moisture is staying on this plant in the morning and it's probably not getting enough, you know, air movement across it. Okay, in the fall, these leaves are going to drop off to the ground, just like I just dropped that one. And uh, so now that is where the leaf spot issue is, is down on the ground. And so if you have plants that have you know, spotting on the leaves like this, you definitely want to clean them up after they lose their leaves in the fall. But even more importantly than that, it's about mulch timing. If I time my mulch application next year before the leaves start to form on this hydrangea, I can actually prevent that disease from bouncing back up on this plant as badly. I will not prevent it. Again, none of these things are going to absolutely prevent anything, but I can definitely lessen the amount uh, by isolating uh, that disease problem down at the ground and not allowing the rainwater, which is actually what's happening, or your irrigation water, to bounce that disease right back up onto the new foliage next spring. 
I actually have a video on this channel for why I mulch early uh, er every year. You know, because the other thing that happens around that same time, right before the leaves start to come out on the, uh, you, you know, on any of your deciduous plants or new growth starts to form on your plants, uh, that's the time that this, the soil warms up enough for weeds to start germinating. And again, weeds are hiding places for these insect problems. So again, that timing of that mulch, trying to get it down, uh, you know, most of the plants in my yard are leafing out in that first two weeks of April, maybe first three weeks of April. So having that mulch down, you know, in the last week of March, you know, timing it based on your uh, area and basically just kind of putting a seal down on top of the soil to prevent the weeds and hopefully prevent some of those disease problems from just constantly repeating themselves. Okay, number eight is crop rotation. You can't really do this with trees and shrubs. It's not like you can go and pop your trees and shrubs out of the ground and move them around every year, but you can certainly do that on your vegetable garden. And so not having your tomatoes in the exact same spot is beneficial. Not having, you know, my, uh, my vegetable plan here is, you know, there's vegetables over here, there's vegetables over there, there's vegetables over there, there's some vegetables in containers over there. They're all spread out all over the place and it does give me the option to then move them around. So if you're using, uh, you know, a technique of blending your vegetables into your shrubs and trees, that's a good idea. Um, other thing is that probably some of the, some of the predator insects may be actually residing uh, in my shrubs. Uh, you know, they're, they're living there. And so by planting the tomatoes right next to these boxwoods, these boxwoods are great cover uh, for, you know, for insects that could probably eat the things that are, would be bothering my tomatoes or my peppers or my, you know, basil, whatever, you know, so something's been chewing a little bit um, on my basil right here. Uh, not that big of a deal, but whatever it is, you know, that predator insect is out here somewhere uh, that, can, that can help me take care of it. And so that blending these things into your shrubs is helpful. And also it's helpful because the next year you don't have to plug your tomatoes right in that spot. You can plug them in that spot over there instead. So number nine is I like to differentiate my lawn from my beds. And, uh, you know, as an, as an example of why this would be helpful, uh, the Japanese beetle larvae are in your lawn eating your roots in the wintertime and then they come out, they emerge as Japanese beetles and go to your plants. If your plants are just right out there in the lawn, uh, it's pretty easy for them to just come up and start devouring your plants pretty quickly. You know, so having some differentiation there can, could help with the beetles. The main thing though is again, it's about plant stress and plants that are grown in the lawn tend to be under, under more stress. Uh, turf is very good at using th the sun's energy uh, to, uh, to, to grow and to, and to use water and use nutrients very, very quickly. That's why we have to fertilize and, and do so many inputs into a turf, into a turf area. The only inputs I have in this bed area right here is I'm putting down mulch. I'm using compost or something when I'm planting. Like I say, then I'm mulching once a year uh, and I'm fertilizing once a year. And that's all the inputs here. Out in a turf area, you know, people are fertilizing three times a year. They're using all kinds of you know, all kinds of inputs. You watch, you know, you watch, watch a lawn, watch some lawn videos on YouTube. You know, they're, they're trying to apply something every, every two weeks. So it takes a lot more inputs. Well, they're going to steal from your plants. Okay. They're going to steal from your, you know, the, the turf is very good at competing against them. And another way in which to invite pests onto those newly planted plants, separate them. If you can create large bed areas, plant into those bed areas and space the plants properly. Like the, some of the things I've been talking about here, try to keep them weed free and that kind of thing and then give your turf its own space. So number 10 is me realizing that me saying pick plants that don't get problems is not gonna be for everyone and that you're still going to wanna to grow things like broccoli, which are very susceptible to, uh, to, to moths and, and chewing insects and, and, and squash and zucchini where, the, where we can get the borers and you know roses, like I say, that the Japanese beetles come out and really tear them up. And uh, in that case, uh, physical barriers are a good idea using some sort of a uh, row crop cover, which are, you know, you can get off of Amazon and then kind of learning the timing. You know, when you see the first few Japanese beetles out and it's something, you know, gets torn up every year, throw that physical barrier over it for two weeks. And, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the beetles run their course pretty quickly. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the squash and the zucchini borers, uh, you know, are a threat most of the season. So you can build some sort of hoop uh, over the top of them. And uh, those, those covers allow enough sun to come through, but they'll should prevent uh, most insect problems. They probably won't prevent all insect problems from happening. So I've gone through 10 items and I have failed to mention uh, how important uh, watering is. Watering is a big time um, component of what can make a plant stressed 
or not stressed uh, during a growing season. So proper watering techniques of you know, watering things and then letting them dry out slightly uh, before watering them again. Sometimes uh, automatic irrigation can end up keeping things too wet. Again, that's another stressor. Um, so, so uh, you know, I manually, uh, I have manual valves on my irrigation for my drip irrigation out here. And so it makes me think before I turn it on uh, it, to, to water. So that's important. Uh, really, that was, so that was like number 11. And then, and then lastly, number 12 is making sure you're cleaning up um, things. If you're, if you're out pruning, you know, don't leave piles of things uh, laying on the ground, uh, leaves and twigs and, and all those kinds of things. I do allow leaves to stay on the ground uh, through the winter um, in my yard. I think it's great, a great insulator. It's nature telling us what it wants to do, which is insulate its own roots in the wintertime. It's why one of the reasons the plants are laying all their leaves down like that, especially in colder areas. Uh, so I do leave them in place and then I mulch over them uh, pretty quickly in the spring with some triple shredded hardwood. It's typically what I use or I'll use pine straw uh, sometimes and I'll kind of isolate them uh, down on the ground and it becomes compost. Uh, over time, but if you have areas where they're really deep around plants, that, that's not a good idea. That's going to be a place for insects and disease to hide and that kind of thing. So really this has been 12 items. Okay, one thing I want to say before I wrap this up is if you are spraying uh, anything in your yard, if, that, you know, if that's a decision you're making because you want roses and that kind of thing, try to use systemic insecticides. If you're using chemicals, use systemic insecticides. Make sure it says that on the label. It, they're even better if it's something you can pour on the ground and the plant actually takes up. So that way the only thing that gets killed is the chewing insects that are actually chewing on the plant. And don't use contact insecticides. Contact insecticides will kill all of your beneficial insects as well. And then you're, what, what you're left with is the aphids or whatever the insect problem is coming back really quickly. They're able to produce thousands very, very quickly. But the beetles aren't. The beetles take a long time to rebuild their population. And so once you put that out of balance, uh, the, the predators are gonna have a hard time coming back and you, that plant's now more and more reliant on you going out and spraying it. So keep that in mind. Use systemic uh, insecticides if that's possible. If you're getting disease issues on leaves uh, over and over and over again, either remove that plant or move it to a space that's getting a little bit more wind uh, movement around it, um, typically. Uh, Plants that dry out, like I said, quicker in the morning uh, are less likely to get severe uh, disease problems on their foliage. So thank you very much for watching this video. Again, uh, these, what became 12 uh, items, uh, definitely I'm not gonna prevent every problem and I have some problems uh, out here, but I think they'll go a long way uh, to helping you um, reduce the amount of problems that you have. I'm very quick to tear something uh, out of the ground that I think is going to, uh, to disrupt the balance of everything or threat or, or me have thinking that I might have to spray it and then disrupting the balance of uh, everything in the yard. So again, please subscribe to my channel for upcoming uh, content. I cover lots of uh, uh, individual shrubs and trees and then uh, do videos uh, that are more instructional like this one. Thanks for watching.